Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Everyone is touched by psychiatric conditions, either themselves or a loved one. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Today on Healthy Minds. Part of how you were able to reach out to the public about this is in the book Concussion and then in the movie Concussion. And I want to ask you, what was it like for you as a physician, as a citizen, to see as a regular person, not a, not a movie star, to see Will Smith portraying you on the big screen? Father. Doctor Omalu. You have no idea how bad this could get. I have to keep going. These men are not machines. We must honor our warriors. You know, the, the first day, it, it took us about six years to make that movie. And the objective, my objective, was to use Hollywood and the movie as a platform to educate the public. That's today on Healthy Minds. Healthy Minds is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation, and the New York State Office of Mental Health. Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Will Smith portrayed him in the movie Concussion, making Dr. Bennett Amalu famous and opening a national discussion about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Today I speak with Dr. Amalu about how to protect your brain and your child's brain from injury, and what to do if you or your child has a concussion. Bennett, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Jeff. I'm happy to be here. I want to start by asking you to explain what is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE? Yes, CTE for short, um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It, it's a disease that belongs to the spectrum of diseases that are caused by all types of brain trauma. It's just one of many diseases. But chronic traumatic encephalopathy, it's a disease that could manifest immediately after months, years, sometimes up to 40 years after you've suffered brain trauma. It first begins with a constellation of symptoms that may involve mood disorders, depression, bipolar disorders, um, impairment of cognitive functioning or impairment of intelligence, like impaired memory, loss of memory, inability to recall things, inability to engage in complex thinking, inability to assimilate new information, inability to manage finances, and then mood fluctuations. Somebody may be a very nice, amicable individual. Suddenly, he becomes this overtly aggressive person um, who has a very short temper, who gets very irritated by minor vexations of daily life. And then um, other aspects uh, that would involve depression, severe depression sometimes. Well, a full gamut yeah. of symptoms, and some people can have one or, or a few of those symptoms. Yes. And the time frame could be, there could be some symptoms right away after yes. the traumatic brain injury, or it could be delayed and show up months or years later. Yes, and, and also there is a, an element of disinhibition, meaning inability to control yourself, greater likelihood of engaging in very risky behavior like drug abuse, alcohol abuse, um, in criminality, sexual improprieties, a constellation of symptomatology that is very broad but all the symptoms will, could be tied down to three, mood disorder, cognitive impairment, and behavioral disorders. Unfortunately, this is the difficult part. 
as of today, there is no cure. Before we talk about potential ways to treat it, tell me a little bit about the types of trauma that can bring this about. We have always known that when you suffer severe traumatic brain injury, like in a car accident, that your brain is permanently damaged. And then in the late 19th century, early 20th century, we began to see, you know, see something similar in boxes. And in the 1930s, we called it dementia pugilistica. That was all we knew. Okay. And we knew, we, we saw boxes who constantly get punched in the head develop this. Yes, and then we actually thought it was more of Parkinson's disease. Then until I did my work, we realized that no, 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 it's not limited only to boxes. It's limited to every contact sport, especially the high impact, high contact collision sports, American football, boxing, ice hockey, mixed martial arts, wrestling, rugby. And these are the games that will place you at the highest risk of sustaining seemingly innocuous repetitive blows to your head that may not cause any immediate symptoms. But as you may know, the brain has no reasonable capacity to regenerate itself. So each and every blow you receive to your head increases your risk of suffering brain damage. The specific threshold for each and every individual, we do not know how many blows you could receive, how many concussions that would cause irreversible brain damage for each and every individual. Science has not unraveled yet. So for some people, they may get hit on the head once and yes. they're fine, nothing happens. We don't know how many times it takes, you can't predict how many times it takes for a particular person. Yes, but, but one thing we know is, just like cigarette smoking, there is nothing like a safe cigarette. You can't tell your patient to smoke one stick of cigarette a day. So there is no safe blow to your head. There is nothing like that. So what you have to do in your life, you do everything you could within your means to prevent your head or avoid your head from receiving any type of impact. Now, you know in life, you can never reduce risk to 0%. It's not feasible. It's like in car driving, you can never erase or eradicate motor vehicle accidents. Accidents will always happen. But what you do is you systemically and systematically mitigate exposure to that risk factor. So in this instance, I don't tell people to avoid sports, no. You can do that. Sports is necessary. So I've, I've given it great thought for in society. Whenever we identify a known risk factor, the first thing we do is we protect our children from that risk factor. They are the most vulnerable of our society. So sometimes we even use legislative tools to protect children. Like in California today, if a, car is in, if a child is in a car, a parent can't smoke inside that car because we know cigarette smoke is a harmful um, um, exposure. I believe strongly that in, in the 21st century that any child under the age of 18 should not be exposed to the risk of permanent brain damage in collision sports. So we should stop exposing children to that known risk factor. Children under the age of 18 should not play these games. You're looking to protect children yes. who are most vulnerable. Yes. What should a person do? Because there are still now, at this point in time, children playing these sports or having some injury outside of those sports. If a child is exposed to a head trauma, what What's the treatment? What, what can be done to at least minimize the risk once that's happened? What I think a parent should do once a child sustains trauma, take your child to the hospital, maybe to the primary care physician, urgent care, or the emergency room, depending on the severity of the injury. 
But if it's a seemingly awkward drama like falling off a bike, yeah, it's good to the emergency room. So you could at least exculpate any severe or catastrophic traumatic brain injury. Then you need to avoid exposure to a repeat trauma. Because we now know that once your child has suffered a first concussion, the risk of a second concussion is higher. The brain of a child is still developing. Still developing. Myelination, the neural processes and pathways are still being set up. So they don't have that dexterity. They don't have that coordination capacity. Bennett, could you describe the difference between a concussion and a subconcussion? OK. Uh, Subconcussions, concussions, all again like CTE belong to the traumatic encephalopathy syndromes. A subconcussion is when you suffer a blow to your head. Although you've suffered microscopic injuries on the cellular level in your brain, you do not manifest immediate incapacitating symptoms, but you've suffered a concussion. Example, a child who's playing football on a field, somebody hits him on the head, he gets a hit, he falls down, he stands up and continues playing. That's a subconcussion. A concussion, again, it's when you suffer a blow to your head, there is injury to your brain, but you have immediate manifestation of incapacitating symptoms, like you're dizzy, you can't remember. That's a concussion. Now, both the subconcussion and the concussion are dangerous. Both are potentially damaging the brain yes. over the long haul. Yes. So this underlies the premise of there is no safe blow to your head. And now, like you saw in the movie, Will Smith was demonstrating, given the human anatomy, the brain floats freely inside your skull. In fact, there are spaces inside the brain to keep it, give it that buoyancy, the ventricles. But there is nothing we could do. There is no helmet designed by man <laughs> that can stop the brain or hold down the brain in the skull to stop you from moving around. And parents need to know that. In fact, the helmet increases the weight of your child's head and makes it more likely for your child to hit with his head, to weaponize his head because he doesn't feel any direct uh, contact on his skin. So what we know, and even professional football players will tell you that, a helmet actually increases your child's risk of suffering brain damage. Because they may use the helmet on their head to hit. to hit. And because the size of your child's head is bigger and the weight is higher, it increases the momentum of the impact. How about helmets for riding a bicycle in case somebody falls off the bicycle? What, what, what's your perspective with regards yes. to that? Helmets are still necessary for preventing fractures of the skull, lacerations of your scalp and your face, and maybe bleeding inside your head. But again, it does not stop your child from suffering a subconcussion or a concussion. So yes, your child sh should still wear helmets while cycling. Um, but I think your child being more careful, not being cycling too fast, uh, avoiding terrains where he or she is more likely to fall would, do, would be more helpful. Because if you wear a helmet and then you're, drive, you're riding your bike in a very um, aggressive manner, it will still increase your risk of a suffering falling and, damage. And yeah. hurting, we we just, need to, just need to be smart. I want to ask you about neuropsychological testing. Yes, please. Tell us what that is and how that can be used. Well, neuropsychological testing is simply a clinical assessment tool. It's not a diagnostic tool. You can use a clinical um, neuropsychological test to make a diagnosis of a concussion. It's simply a test, a clinical test we use in every aspect of um, <clears throat> neurology, psychiatry, excuse me. You know, I read newspapers, I watch television. There's been this aggressive marketing stance to use neuropsychiatric testing as the as, as the answer to concussions, no, it's not. In fact, in fact, 
once your child has suffered a concussion, there's actually nothing a neuropsychiatric or neuropsychological test does for you. The commonness is impact. And parents need to know that. Once a child has suffered a concussion, there is nothing neuropsychological testing does for your child, nothing. All it does is to assess your child to see if your child has suffered or uh, is manifesting symptoms. And so, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't do anything. It's not a form of treatment. It's not. If a child does suffer a concussion, what steps should the parent take right then and there with regards to post-concussion treatment? Right there and then take your child out of play. The first thing you must do, take your child out of play. Your child shouldn't play far. My opinion is your child shouldn't play that game again, whatever game it is. Then the next thing is take your child to see a physician who is an expert in the management of traumatic brain injury, because not every physician has the expertise. Many times these physicians, neurologists, psychiatrists, sports medicine physicians, rehabilitation physicians, they are in university hospital centers. You go, you seek their expertise, but as a parent, the first thing you should do, take your child out of the game. And you know, sometimes they say, oh, if the symptoms disappear after two weeks, that is not true. As a neuropathologist, two, three, four weeks after your child has suffered a concussion, the brain hasn't healed. There are still massive amounts of inflammation in your child's brain. So if the child breaks their arm, yes. you're going to take them out of the game right then and there and make sure the arm is, yes. gets the treatment. The brain is just as important, if not more important, than the arm. Yes. Thank, thank you for saying that. Thank you for reminding me. That. OK, very good. Your child suffers a fracture. OK, you keep your child out for months, sometimes up to six months, so that the skeleton heals. The brain is more vulnerable than the skeleton. It doesn't have the ability to reel and regenerate as your skeleton. So why would you take your child back in only two weeks? Because a concussion actually, one of the injuries involved is multiple fractures of the cellular skeleton, the cytoskeleton, okay, which is more vulnerable than your skeleton. So you think about it critically. If I wouldn't send back my child to play with a skeletal fracture for months, three to six months. Why would I then send him back to play after only two weeks when he suffered a fracture of his brain? Does that make sense? The more parents understand this, the more they would be equipped and enabled to make the right decision. Sports is a good thing for children. It helps their psychosocial development. All it takes to damage a child's brain is just one concussion or more. Science has proven that. A child's brain is still developing. The neurons, the over 200 billion cells, are making connections with one another. That's a very sensitive time of a child's development. So whenever you have trauma, subconcussion or concussion is simply a sharing of the brain. The brain is 60 to 80% water. So when you have such a sharing effect, what does it do? It disrupts the fibers that are making connections. So when that happens, it undermines your child's capacity to reach his full intellectual capacity. So the, the message for parents is, first of all, take any step to minimize the risk of an injury, of yes. a concussion. And second of all, if a child, unfortunately, does have one, to be even extra cautious yes. because another one is even a greater risk. So and it's more likely to cautious up front and then even more cautious yes. afterwards. Yes. Now, you've been making this message. Um, what has been the response as you've spoken to people in the medical profession, to families, What's been the response to you making this message? It's about public education. People need to be aware. And for example, 
one thing legislatively we could do is to mandate that any parent whose child is engaging in these high impact, high contact sports should have at least a one hour of risk exposure lecture so that they know. Now, people have come to me, oh, Ben, but if children do not play these games, the games would eventually die away. I don't agree with that. Children do not join the military. Has the military died away? Children do not drive until they are adults. Has driving died away? Knowing what we know today, we shouldn't let our fears drive us. No. Do what is right as given to us by science and by our humanity. Science is telling us that, look, when you play these games, that you suffer brain damage. OK, let's accept it for what it is. Accept the truth and seek remedies. Seek remedies. But as long as you continue to deny the truth, you'll be held bondage and you could never unravel the solutions. It's as simple as that. Part of how you were able to reach out to the public about this is in the book Concussion yes. and then in the movie Concussion. Yes. And I want to ask you, what was it like for you as a physician, as a citizen, to see, as a regular person, not a, not a movie star, to see Will Smith portraying you on the big screen? You know, the, the first day, it, it took us about six years to make that movie. And the objective, my objective, was to use Hollywood and the movie as a platform to educate the public. So when the movie was done, it was edited, I was flown down to Hollywood to see it the first time. So I went in with some other people. And it began the first scene and Will Smith was in um, a courtroom testifying. And then the first time somebody called him Dr. Malu, I, I didn't realize it, really. Um, it, it didn't hit me. I, I, it was like I was in a trance. What is going on? It was only when the scene where he proposed to my wife that I realized, oh, this is me. So it was like I was, I went into this abstractual life. It, it wasn't a very good experience. It's like you think about it, transplanting yourself into another person. It's a, it's a very weird experience. Um, in fact, a couple of days after I had seen the movie the first time, I, I suffered some type of um, psychological trauma. Uh, it, uh, it impacted me in a way I just, even till today, I can't describe. However, it's uh, two years now. I think Will Smith did a phenomenal job in acting me. Because without him, honestly, without Will, uh, the national discourse on concussion wouldn't be where it is today. He did add so much um, public service, gave us so much public service in agreeing to play that role in the movie, because he didn't want to do the movie. So I'm, I'm deeply thankful and grateful that Hollywood, Will Smith, Peter London's man, David Walter, of all of them came together to do something that would save yet another child from suffering brain damage. It, so um, it, it's, uh, it can only happen in America. Uh, it's simply an American experience, if I could say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bennett, I want to thank you for the work that you've done, thank for you. sharing so much about your own experiences, yes. and certainly for joining me here today. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very me. much. Bless you. <laughs> Dr. Omalu has been at the forefront of understanding the effects of head injuries and advocating steps to reduce the risk of injuries. We all need to make decisions about our own safety 
and the safety of our children. So his findings are important for each of us to consider. And if your child has a concussion or other traumatic injury to the head, do not allow your child to suffer in silence. Seek medical attention. With help, there is hope. Until next time, I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Goodbye. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Healthy Minds is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation, and the New York State Office of Mental Health. If you would like to watch our expert interview in its entirety, log on to bbrfoundation.org slash healthyminds.